Hello everyone. Today I want to trace some of the economic underpinnings of colonial life during the 18th century as a background for understanding the desire of the new Bourbon dynasty which will come to rule Spain and of course Spanish America in the 18th century. In the next lecture I want to look specifically at the nature of administration and administrative reforms under the Bourbon monarchy. But here the focus will be on the economics. But let me start with a little bit of background on Spanish royal power itself. By the start of the 1700s, Spanish royal power had become a mere shadow of its former self. Whereas other European monarchs had strengthened their dynastic absolutism by basing it on the dual pillars of a standing army and more effective fiscal control, two measures which we need to understand as at the root of modernization, in Spain the monarchy had suffered a progressive loss of authority and power. Charles II was, in fact, a near imbecile. He governed between 1665 and 1700, a time which saw a period of creeping feudalism return to Spain. The territorial aristocracy extended its jurisdiction over districts and towns and dominated the central councils of the crown royal troops decayed. Taxes were farmed out regularly, often to foreign merchants. Everything, every office almost, was for sale. The result was foreign invasion and the defeat of the Habsburg House. The death of Charles II in 1700 precipitated a general European war fought over the Spanish throne, particularly between the French Bourbon House and the Austrian Habsburg House which was supported by Great Britain, Holland, and Portugal. These latter countries were fearful of France's gaining power over the continent in general. It was a ferocious war, uh, including this Battle of Malplaquette, which was fought in Belgium on September 9th of 1709. While the war lasted from 1701 to 1713, in this single battle alone, in six hours of fighting, over 40,000 soldiers were killed or wounded. The war ended with the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht, which recognized the sorry state into which the Spanish crown had fallen. Spain's European empire was effectively dismantled. Spain itself was passed on to Philip of Anjou, the grandson of Louis XIV. He became Philip V of Spain and the first monarch of the Bourbon dynasty to rule in Spain. The Austrian Habsburg Empire received the Low Countries, Milan, Sardinia, and Naples. In this map you could see the situation on the ground in 1700 all the territories that appear in a sort of light orange color were owned by the Habsburg Empire. After that time, it's really just Spain. The King of Savoy would get Sicily out of this, and this is the moment in time when the British will win Gibraltar and Menorca and the Asiento for 30 years, the Asiento meaning the legal right to trade slaves in the New World. They also won the right to dispatch an annual ship carrying 500 tons of merchandise to trade with Spain's colonies in the New World. Spain indeed was in a lamentable shape even as late as the mid-1700s. It was a backward, peripheral, dependent area of Western Europe. And if it was to be roused to action, as it soon was, the impetus for this came not from Spain itself, but from the colonies. The economic growth of the 18th century in Spain was based on the possibilities inherent in its colonial economy, not in the peninsular Spanish economy itself. And when the crown felt truly threatened by the loss of its colonial trade, that's the moment when it was really roused to action. It was estimated that in 1689, of the 27,000 tons of merchandise which were legally dispatched to Spanish America, only 1,500 tons originated in Spain. The bulk of exports from Seville and Cadiz, which went to the New World, 
consisted of manufactured goods from France, England, and Holland. Challenged in terms of legal exports to the Americas from Cadiz, the monarchy was even more threatened by the nature of illegal exports. The English entered through the granting of the asiento, the slave trade, but they were able to engage in all kinds of contraband trading from Jamaica, which they controlled after 1655, and their other colonies in the Caribbean. In 1704, the French as well had received permission, coming off of the War of the Spanish Succession, to enter the Pacific in order to trade freely with Peru and Chile. For the first half of the 18th century, the Spanish would fight to regain control of its commercial monopoly, now lost in the colonies. The attempt by Spain, then, was an attempt to get as much economic benefit out of its New World colonies as the English and the French and even the Dutch seemed to be getting out of theirs. For a variety of reasons, including another series of wars, the opening of direct trading to Buenos Aires and the Pacific ports of South America, and the final termination of the fleet system Spain actually was rather successful in recapturing its colonial monopoly by about the middle of the 18th century. Even the English gave up their right to the asiento in 1750 in return for a payment of 100,000 pounds sterling. More than anything else, however, it was the Seven Years' War with Great Britain in the 1760s which led the Bourbon reformers in Spain to realize that some drastic changes would be necessary. We know this as the French and Indian War in North America, and it had significant effects in terms of the British victory in Canada, its final consolidation of control in Canada, as well as British control in the rest of North America. For the Spanish, it would also have serious implications. The Spanish lost Manila to the English in August of 1742 and Havana in July of 1763. This was a serious blow for the Spanish. Havana's sole purpose for existing at that point of time, when neighboring San Domingue, which we now know as Haiti, was producing more sugar than any other colony in the New World, Havana's main purpose, Cuba's main purpose, was to militarily preserve Spanish control over the Americas, over its American colonies. It guarded the outgoing silver fleets, and it served as a staging area for any attack on Mexico. The rapid loss of Havana to the British was disturbing, to say the least, to the Spanish. But even more troublesome was the commercial consequences of British control over that city. Before 1762, no more than 15 ships called there in any single year. But during the 11 months that the British remained in Havana Harbor, they were, they were finally kicked out by the colonists after that time. In those 11 months, over 700 merchant vessels alone entered with English manufactured goods and foodstuffs and timber and animals and ironware and, of course, more and more slaves. Spain, again, was not using its colonies to the extent that the British or the French were milking theirs. While the figures are a little hard to come by in a comparative sense, the following numbers can illustrate the problem that was faced by the Spanish. If you look at British imports from the West Indies into Britain, it valued about 17.3 million pesos in the 1780s. French imports from saint domingue from the little island of Haiti at that point of time, were equal to about 27 million pesos. If you include the French imports from all of its West Indian colonies, that came up to about 30.5 million pesos. But if you look at the Spanish imports from all of the Spanish Empire at that time in the Americas, that was a total of only 34 million pesos. In other words, even at the end of the Bourbon period of control, the Spanish had not nearly 
develop their colonies to the same extent that the British or the French had. Well, let's return to examine the Spanish-American economy to see how it developed during the 18th century. While silver remained very important in the overall economy coming from Spanish America, by the 18th century, the thrust of colonial export economy was away from Potosí and Peru and toward New Spain's mines, and away from more traditional core areas in general and towards the periphery. In other words, the Caribbean, the southern Pacific around Chile and the coastline of Peru, the Rio de la Plata region in the southern Atlantic, and finally the northern area of South America. What we find is that there's a major change in a variety of areas, not just in terms of which areas were important, but in terms of two main regimes that ruled at that time. The first one was that as opposed to the forced labor systems of the Habsburgs, the workforce in these new areas, the core areas, would consist of African slaves and plantation economies in general, and of free wage workers from the casta or creole population in the other areas. The old obligated labor market was to remain in effect only around Potosí and Huancavelica. The second most important thing is who was important. If encomenderos or government officials were the key to the Habsburg economy, in the new Bourbon economy it would be merchants and entrepreneurs who were central, with the merchants lending money to producers so that they could either buy slaves or advance wages to their workers. What we begin to see in the 18th century is the decline in the power of royal officials to regulate the economy even as they increase their power over the political and administrative aspect of colonial existence. There are some exceptions to this, but by and large, this is the rule. The center point of Bourbon economic resurgence was in the northern mines of Mexico. Production in the Mexican mines had bottomed out sometime in the early 1600s. By 1690, production was back to its pre-depression high of about 5 million pesos minted of silver. Production shot up to about 24 million pesos by 1798, and by then Mexico accounted for nearly 70 percent of all American silver that was produced, with Guanajuato by itself equaling the production of the entire Viceroyalty of Peru. Aside from these traditional areas of silver mining, the 18th century saw the introduction of a wide range of new export products from different places in Spanish America. In the first place there was cochineal production, which came from southern Mexico. Cochineal, of course, the red dye that was produced from the females of a small insect. Indigo, a dye that came from plants, was important in Central America. Gold became more and more important from the areas of Popayan and Antioquia in Colombia, and cacao, Venezuela. Besides these, you could also look at new areas of gold, silver, and copper production in Chile, the growing importance of the export of uh, cattle hides from Buenos Aires, that would be really the key to the 19th century. And then there was the export of sugar in Cuba. Cuba was where Spain was the most shocked by the English invasion of 1763. And it would be the one place in the Spanish-American colonial world where a significant export economy was built in the second part of the 18th century. I want to look at Cuba in particular within the context of these expanding areas of the Spanish-American economy in the 18th century. 
with the English ensconced in Havana in 1763, they would begin to import African slaves at a very rapid clip. Five times as much in the 11 months that they were there as Spain had imported in the previous five years. With the revolt in Saint-Domingue in Haiti in 1791, which removed that most productive of all sugar colonies from sugar producing whatsoever, production in Cuba was generally stimulated. The slave population on the island rose from 86,000 in 1792 to over 400,000 by the 1860s. Exports, which stood at 5 million pesos in 1790s, were up past 11 million pesos 10 years from that time. By the first decade of the 19th century, Cuba's registered overseas trade equaled that of New Spain, and Havana, with 70,000 people, was one of Spanish America's largest cities. The production for export expanded markedly in Spanish America over the course of the 18th century. But still, on the French colony of Saint-Domingue, in 1789, the value of its exports, arising from a population of about a half a million people, 450,000 of whom were slaves, that output nearly equaled the output of all of Spanish America with its population of 14.5 million people. By the 1800s, as I noted, Spanish America had an estimated population of around 14.5 million people. This was compared to about 10.5 million people who lived in Spain at the time. Most of these people were engaged in some kind of agricultural pursuits. We could argue that still in the 18th century many, if not the majority, of Indian villages still possessed enough land to support their inhabitants. This was particularly true in central and southern Mexico and the central Andes. They produced their own foodstuffs and clothes. Production for the market was quite limited. Instead, exchange took place on the basis of barter between villages or even within a single village. On the other hand, the Crown's demand for labor services, for cash tribute payments, and above all the so-called repartimiento de comercio, which means the forced sale of goods, all required that more and more people enter the money economy in order to pay for what they needed by cash. By contrast to this native village economy, the haciendas, which expanded at this period of time, were geared for market production, primarily to serve the towns of urban-oriented Spanish America. They produced cereals, grains, other basic foodstuffs for the towns, for the mining camps, for the ports. All these items of high bulk and low price, which would make them too expensive to ship in from Spain itself. Alongside of these haciendas growing wheat and other cereal products, there were the plantations. And although most plantations produced for European markets, some were geared to Latin American production as well. New Spain and Peru both had sugar industries serving local production interests, for example. And then there's, of course, the stock-raising enterprises, the estancias. They were generally still producing in the 18th century for a local market. They produced meat and wool and tallow and other products. Ranching tended to be relegated to the frontier areas of Spanish America. Latin America was divided into huge areas of transhumans, where tens of thousands of animals would yearly be driven to market and they would go along a number of routes. They would be driven from the Argentine Pampas to the Andean highlands via the city of Salta in Argentina. They would go from the northern part of Mexico in Nuevo Leon and Coahuila to the central city of Mexico City. K 
cattle and cattle products from Chile would be shipped regularly to Lima markets. And from Venezuela, cattle products would reach their way into all of the Caribbean. As the population of Latin America grew, so the economy became more and more geared to its own internal ebb and flow. Long-term trends would be affected by international e economic movements, but the domestic market would generally respond to its own rhythms. Tenancy on these agricultural units, such as the haciendas, relied increasingly on a small number of resident peons, and then on top of that they would hire seasonal labor from neighboring villages, from the hacienda's own tenants. In Mexico, landowners rented out a large amount of their land to tenants in return for rents paid in cash, in kind, or in labor. In Chile, these labor payments were known as inquilinaje. In Peru, it was called the llanoconaje. In summary, when we look at the economic changes that took place under the Bourbon government, we find a shift, geographic shift, from core areas around Mexico and Peru to the new and growing periphery, the southern Pacific, the southern Atlantic, the northern tip of South America around Venezuela and Colombia, the northern parts of Mexico, for example, and the Caribbean. We find that the monarchy was only partially successful in terms of controlling the economy and that the economy increasingly was driven by internal economic rhythms. Throughout the course of the century, there was a long stretch of economic revival from the 17th century depression, which had seriously affected the output of the economy. And we find that there was a replacement of state-controlled labor, of coercive labor system to private mechanisms all of these would have a positive impact on the economic situation in colonial Spanish America. Ironically, it would be this kind of economic revival that would also encourage the slowly emerging movements towards independence by the part of the Criollos themselves over the course of this century. But we'll look at that at a later lecture. From here, I'll turn in the next lecture to looking at some of the administrative changes which took place during this Bourbon monarchy. That's it. Bye-bye.